Good evening from New Center, Maine. I'm Pat Callahan. 207 won't be seen this evening, so we can bring you Governor Janet Mills' State of the Budget Address. The governor recorded her budget message last night, and in a couple of minutes it will be streamed and broadcast to a statewide audience. New Center, Maine's Don Carrigan is here. And Don, this is going to have a sharper focus than the typical State of the State Address. Absolutely. Normally, the governor's giving this to a joint session of the House and Senate in the State House, 186 legislators, plus people in the gallery, applause, all of that stuff. None of that because of COVID. The governor in her office, I believe, uh, straight to the camera and is going to give her message. We're told she's going to be stressing health care, education, economic development, doing things to get the budget, the uh, state's budget on track and the state's economy uh, to help it bounce back. Uh, incidentally, Pat, uh, as you and I were talking, the legislature's actually had this budget proposal for just about a month now, so they're already working on it. So this is a pitch to the people of Maine. It's a way for the governor to directly speak to them. She's going to be doing that in just a few minutes, Don, and we'll, uh, after we come back, Zach Blanchard's going to be talking with our new Senator of Maine political brew analyst online. And here we now listen to Governor Janet Mills from the State House. Good evening. You know, there's never been a better time than a Maine winter night to look up at the stars. It was my grandfather, a man from Ashland who looked like Gary Cooper, who showed me how to find Orion in the night sky and the Big Dipper and the North Star. And I couldn't rely on Google or a book on the stars or a television series, the Dis Discovery Channel or a Netflix special on astronomy. It's not a book or a map that I rely on now to pick out those constellations. It is the memory of my grandfather's loving voice, his outstretched arm pointing my young eyes to the deep sky. It is not Google alone that will show us how to live today, not Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter that will teach us how to love or teach us wisdom and compassion. It is experience, resilience, and importantly, perseverance, like the perseverance of an Aroostook County farmer. We've been through a lot these past 12 months, you and I, and perseverance will see us through these times, no matter who we are or where we live. Our entire state has been through so much this year, our whole country. We've been tested. A deadly terror invaded our nation, indeed the globe. Our border with Canada, the world's longest, closed for the first time ever. Cruise ships canceled, classrooms closed, graduations celebrated in large open parking lots and drive-in theaters, weddings postponed funerals held to small, hugless gatherings. Loggers and haulers were idled in a paperless economy while a paper mill's giant digesters blew up in broad daylight, threatening the lives of hundreds and the livelihoods of thousands. Lunch rooms and popular restaurants were limited to takeout and curbside pickup. Pick Hotels and stores operated at unheralded losses. Souvenir shops, water slides, agricultural fairs, auto races, church services, baseball games, football contests, all dramatically and drastically modified, transformed, or canceled. At the same time, a man named George Floyd was killed at the hands of law enforcement officers in Minneapolis, lighting a firestorm of protests across the country, including many here in Maine, proclaiming loudly that black lives matter. A general election challenged our ability to adapt and yet brought out the largest turnout in Maine history with more than 62% voting absentee or in advance, including 100-year-old Phyllis Nickel of Rockport, who has now seen her 26th presidential election. And on the national level, a presidential contest seemed to test our sanity, even, during the, even the durability of our democratic institutions. Everything we've known, everything that was familiar, so much was canceled, modified, restricted. Our world changed, and we had new words to define it. We learned or reinvented words like quarantine, PPE, bubble, cohort, flatten the curve, super spreader, throughput, surge, social distancing, positivity rate. Other words have taken on new meanings and popularity like pivot, variant, you're on mute and of course, Zoom. More importantly, however, now a half a million Americans have died with COVID-19. Nationally, those lives include notables like Herman Cain, Charlie Pride, 
John Prine, Annie Glenn, Larry King, and the newly elected House Speaker of the House in New Hampshire, Dick Hinch. In May, we've lost more than 650 people. Friends, loved ones, neighbors, each with a life that had meaning and purpose. People like Ron Johnson, father of five, a former Major League Baseball player, coach, manager of the Portland Sea Dogs, and people like Kirk Kelsey, a member of the historic Washburn family that includes Israel Washburn, Maine's governor at the start of the Civil War. Dozens of Maine veterans, sailors, gunmen, mechanics, died without family members at their bedside, without color guards or taps played at their memorial services. Heroes like Rob Fleury, 94 years old, who served in the Navy in World War II, and Dr. Jim Paris, also a World War II veteran who dropped out of high school to join the war effort and later enjoyed the big dance bands on the Old Orchard Beach Pier. Another great hero died this year. Hammer and Hank Aaron, the right fielder who broke Babe Ruth's home run record in 1974 and who holds the record for the most all-star picks. But a year later, he broke another equally important record, surpassing Babe Ruth in RBIs, ending his career with 2,297 runs batted in. That baseball great who grew up in a family too poor to buy a baseball bat, a black man who faced hate and adversity, did not just revel in the solo performance of home run hitting alone in the limelight. No, his greater accomplishment, I think, was the reward of bringing his teammates home, one after the other. A home run, you know, may win a ball game once in a while, but more often, it's the steady work of base hit after base hit an effort driven by many rather than just one that wins the games. We too are a team of multi-talented players, some known for their home run hitting power or timely base hits, others for tracking down that deep fly ball or pinch running the bases, but all in their own ways contribute to the success of the team. This is the story of Maine as well. One team of many a team that includes unsung heroes, some of whom face adversity day after day, but all of whom contribute to our success. They are nurses, bus drivers, CNAs, teachers and ed techs, volunteers, working parents stretched to the nines, delivery drivers, grocery clerks, fishermen, haulers and farmers, and so, so many more. You know who you are. During this pandemic, Despite the risks to yourselves and the adversity of our time, and through courage, compassion, and perseverance, you've helped our state succeed. You've saved lives and secured the future of so many children. You, the people of Maine, are our most valuable players. For that true team effort, we need look no further than innovative Maine companies like IDEX, Challenges of our times. IDEX, well known for its work in veterinary science, shifted to produce innovative testing materials for COVID-19 at a time when testing was very scarce. They helped us more than triple our capacity to test Maine people for COVID, a huge lifesaver in those early dark days of the pandemic. Other companies like Main Source Machining, which makes barbecues, switched to manufacturing ballot drop boxes designed by members of the community colleges to help us conduct a safe election. Breweries and distillers like Main Craft Distilling shifted to producing hand sanitizer. L.L. Bean and Flowfold and others produced face masks and face shields. Lee Auto produced public service ads on public health precautions. Bangor Savings funded internet devices for needy school children. The Maine Coast Fishermen's Association started the Fishermen's Feeding Mainers program to buy fish directly from fishermen, handing it off to local processors to cut, package, and freeze to feed hungry Maine people. And the state was also ha happy to help with that effort. I applaud the more than 3,000 hospitality workers who participated in COVID-19 safety training that was offered by the Maine Community College system to protect Maine people and visitors alike. This is innovation, making our state safe. This is ingenuity. This is perseverance. This is Maine people working together. 
My administration has sought to do its part to protect the lives and livelihoods of Maine people. With help from the Maine legislature last spring, we began rallying the forces necessary to help people who were suffering job losses, getting food to school children, and building our team of health professionals to protect Maine families from this dangerous virus. My administration implemented public health and safety measures, dialing them up and then scaling them down when we believed the circumstances demanded it. We directed people to wear masks in public, much the same as they would wear a hard hat at a construction site or safety glasses and ear protectors, protectors in a paper mill. We asked you to watch your distance and avoid large gatherings, and you did. We then went to work distributing federal funds to support the Maine economy and aid Maine people who were in desperate need. We distributed more than $255 million in economic recovery grants to small businesses and $294 million to bolster the Unemployment Trust Fund and avoid large tax hikes on small businesses. We gave out more than $25 million for one-time $600 payments to 40,000 unemployed people who were about to lose their benefits. We provided $28 million for rental assistance to prevent eviction, and we bought $9.3 million worth of at-home learning devices, tablets, and Wi-Fi hotspots for more than 21,000 students trying to learn remotely, but they didn't have internet access. We even partnered with local broadband providers dedicating $5.6 million to build out broadband infrastructure and deliver high-speed internet to more than 730 students in rural Maine. We distributed $20 million in federal relief funds to Maine fishermen and $18 million to farmers and food banks. We partnered with towns and cities allocating $13 million for the Keep Maine Healthy program that promoted public health and educational initiatives during the busy tourist season, including beach ambassadors who kept Maine people safe. The collective efforts of our people and their government, for now, are working. According to the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, adjusted for population, Maine ranks second lowest in the nation in total hospitalizations, third lowest in total number of cases, fourth lowest in number of deaths from COVID-19. Our testing volume is seventh best in the nation, and our positivity rate over the last 14 days is second lowest in the country. And right now, Maine is in the top tier of states in the dis distribution of the vaccine. I'm pleased that we're beginning to see an increase in the supply of these vaccines, though demand everywhere continues to far outpace supply, and that has compelled us to make some hard choices. Like nearly every state, we started with frontline healthcare professionals, nurses and doctors who were working day in and day out to keep us alive and healthy. We also vaccinated police, firefighters, EMTs, and other critical first responders to make sure that our emergency response system remains strong. So we know that even if we experience another surge, our life-saving professionals will be there for us. In designating other categories eligible for the limited supply of vaccine, each, st each state must then consider its unique circumstances. Maine has the oldest population of any state in the country. And while younger people are often exposed to the public to a large extent, it is our older people who are much more likely to get sick and die if they do contract the virus. It's also easy to verify their status, which makes vaccination clinics move swiftly and efficiently. Our fundamental goal is to protect our most vulnerable, and that's why we're doing it by vaccinating those who are 70 and older right now. Today, thanks to the Department of Health and Human Services, the Maine CDC, Northern Light, Maine Health, hospitals and healthcare providers across the state, more than 200,000 people have received their first dose of vaccine more than 15% of our population. Many of them, like the people I met at the Bangor Clinic, are folks who literally have not been out of the house in 10 or 11 months, not hugged a grandchild, not had coffee with their best friend, not taken walks with a neighbor, but they have persevered. And the sense of relief they have is palpable. Now Maine is among the top 20 states in the nation for getting shots in arms. It hasn't been easy undertaking the greatest mass vaccination effort in modern day history, especially in a rural state such as ours. 
there have been some bumps and the road ahead is still difficult. But we are now in a race between vaccinations and the emergence of more contagious variants. And we hope in the foreseeable future, with your help, we can win this race and we'll be able to welcome all children back to the classroom and to fully open gyms, restaurants, stores, churches, stadiums, auditoriums, theaters, museums, and playing fields. As always, we start with fact and science and base our decisions on how we can accomplish the most good for the most people. And as for all things COVID, we owe a great deal of thanks to two of the hardest working, smartest, and most ethical professionals I've ever worked with. DHHS Commissioner Jean Lambrew and CDC Director Nirav Shah. Meanwhile, this pandemic has hit our economy pretty hard, but the economy is recovering. Building supplies, consumer sales, auto and business operating sales, retail sales are up. Home sales reached record highs in 2020 as Maine people realized, other people realized too, that Maine is one of the safest states in the nation. They know that we have a strong public health focus with some of the best COVID-19 statistics in the nation, as well as the lowest violent crime rate, one of the lowest property crime rates, low prison rates, unmatched natural resources, and a quality of life that is the envy of many. In December alone, housing sales rose 31.5%, and the median sales price jumped by more than 15% since December 2019. One out of three home sales went to out-of-state buyers. Maine has had a 4.6% growth in construction jobs during the pandemic, according to the Associated General Contractors of America. Maine's increase in construction jobs was the fifth highest in the nation. Maine ranks highest of all the New England states in returning to pre-pandemic economic activity, according to the CNN Business Back to Normal Index. Well, while this is welcome, welcome news, many people in Maine and some Maine businesses are still hurting, but still persevering. And there's much more to be done starting with work on the state budget. That budget carries forward the work we began two years ago on health care, education, and the economy. And it responds to public health needs that are exacerbated by the pandemic. From the beginning, my administration has worked to make health care more affordable so that every person can see a doctor, obtain life-saving medications, stay healthy, and support their families. From the beginning, we focused on improving public education, too, so that every child, no matter their zip code, has the same chance of success. From the beginning, too, we have focused on expanding economic opportunity for people across the state. Those priorities were strongly reflected in our first budget, which began to rebuild our public health infrastructure, protecting public safety, funding voter-approved Medicaid expansion that now provides health care to more than 70,000 people, and investing in public schools that raise the minimum teacher salary. We increase our ability to protect children from abuse and neglect. We budgeted for services for our most vulnerable citizens, and we focused on economic development to attract good-paying jobs to Maine. This pandemic has not changed those priorities, but rather only underscored their importance and the importance of our investing in them. Now is the time to maintain those investments. Like many states, last spring, Maine faced a significant budget shortfall caused by the pandemic that made crafting a biennial budget pretty challenging. So to fill a potential hole in the budget, we curbed spending without sacrificing general purpose aid to education, without laying off hardworking state employees, without diminishing our basic social safety net or hampering our COVID-19 response. It worked. As a result of those cost-saving actions we took early on and with the help of federal funds for which Senators Susan Collin and Angus King and Representatives Chelly Pingree and Jerry Golden deserve great credit. We closed the gap and we have presented comprehensive balanced budget proposals to this legislature. These proposals are straightforward and no nonsense. They have basic goals to beat back the pandemic, keeping Maine people healthy and saving lives, to fund education, 
and to stay, maintain a stable economy and get people back to work. These budgets continue cost-saving measures that we put in place at the onset of the pandemic while protecting the vital services on which Maine people rely. These budgets include $3 million for the Health and Environmental Testing Lab, the Health Inspection Program, Maine Immunization Program, and the Public Health Emergency Response Program. $5 million for COVID-19 testing for vaccines and support services for people in quarantine. $45 million in additional funds for K-12 public education, making progress toward a minimum teacher salary of $40,000, and helping school districts manage in-person, remote, and hybrid learning options during the pandemic. If approved, this increase will result in the highest level of state funding for education ever. Six million dollars is in the budget to fund Section 29 services for adults with developmental disabilities in their communities. 25 million for the Medicaid Stabilization Fund to protect basic health care during this challenging time. 45 million dollars for main care rate increases for nursing facilities, residential facilities for children and older Mainers, services for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and other providers. Seven and a half million dollars for mental health and substance use disorder, including community mental health, and including two million dollars for our options initiative, so we can dispatch mobile response teams to communities that have high rates of drug overdoses, something that's more important than ever before, given the increase in overdose deaths in Maine and the rest of the nation during this pandemic and $82 million in tax relief for all Maine small businesses who receive the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, including complete relief for 99.1% of them and significant though partial relief for the less than 1% of larger businesses that got more than a million dollars of PPP. In all, my budget proposals do their best to hold spending steady and preserve public health and education during the pandemic. Together, they maintain the state's important relationship with town, county, and school administrative units, all of whom receive more than a third of all general fund appropriations. Now, I've heard the calls of those who say we should enact sweeping budget cuts. And I agree that state government cannot be all things to all people all the time, and it cannot solve all of our problems or address the needs of all people. But history has shown that we cannot cut our way to prosperity. During emergencies such as this, people depend on us to protect children, to secure health care, to safeguard educational and career opportunities, and protect the most vulnerable of our citizens. I am not going to walk away from or abandon Maine families in their time of greatest need, especially those who are out of work through no fault of their own because of a worldwide pandemic. Now I've heard also the calls of those who say we must spend a lot more, even if it means we should dip into our savings. This too, I believe we should not do. You know, when you have a fever or when your state has had a fever, you don't say, okay, now get up and run laps and do 100 push-ups. Recovery, getting back into shape, is not immediate. Its course is not always predictable. This budget, though, provides basic continuity, consistency, and stability, something our state needs at this time. It is focused on recovery. There's more to do. During the pandemic, as before, our focus is on health care, education, and the economy. I want to diversify our economy, provide good-paying jobs in every corner of this state, an opportunity for all Maine families, I want a future in this state for every Maine child. I want people to see Maine not simply as vacation land, though it is, but as a great place to live year-round, to work and raise a family. And I want our young people to know that they don't have to leave the state to get a first-class education or find work that is gratifying, useful, financially rewarding. We want career ladders that give us more plumbers, mechanics, nurses, and carpenters, as well as entrepreneurs who will work in software design, robotics, and artificial intelligence without having to leave the state for places like Silicon Valley. We will build that Maine, and we will build a better, brighter future for all. So where do we start? 
my, my administration's 10-year economic development plan, as well as the recommendations of the Economic Recovery Committee that I convened last year, point the way. We need a strong, vibrant, and skilled workforce here in Maine. There are good paying jobs in the trades, in electrical or plumbing work, in construction and manufacturing, in healthcare and life sciences, and in clean energy that are going unfilled. We have to connect the workforce with those jobs and make an investment in new jobs at the same time. That's why my administration in the coming weeks will lay out a back to work bond that asks for $25 million to partner with Maine's career and technical education centers and our community colleges to provide equipment and train skilled workers to fill jobs in high growth industries, including manufacturing and clean energy. To that same end, I have set a goal of doubling Maine's clean, ener clean energy jobs in the next 10 years, and in the coming weeks, my administration will stand up a key recommendation of the state's 10-year economic plan, the Maine Career Exploration Program. Backed by funding secured through the New England Clean Energy Connect project, we're launching a program in Franklin and Somerset counties to provide scholarships and paid internships for local students with local employers. These internships will provide real world job experience in the trades, healthcare, and other fields, connecting Maine kids to our economy and putting them on the path to good paying jobs here in Maine. Ultimately, our goal is to expand this program statewide to ensure that 100% of Maine students have the option for a six month paid internship between their junior year of high school and one year after high school graduation. The time for innovation is also now. Maine was built by farmers, foresters, and fishermen, and we have carved our lives and livelihoods out of the bold rocky coast, the tall pines, and the rolling fields. These in industries and all whom they employ are the foundation of our economy and they are central to our future. We must help them through this time of hardship and transition, and we must fight against ineffective federal regulations like the proposed right whale rule that threaten their success. In our back to work proposal, we will ask for $50 million for these heritage industries to increase local processing infrastructure, to improve access to markets, and to allow Maine companies to modernize and add value to products that are grown, caught, cultured, made here in Maine. We know what this future looks like. Just last week, LP Building Solutions, a Tennessee-based wood products manufacturer, announced that it's investing about $150 million to convert part of its mill in New, New Limerick to manufacture advanced engineered wood siding. They chose to expand here in Maine because of our work ethic and because of our wood supply. They expect to increase local wood consumption by 30% and utilize local suppliers and small businesses. The result? good paying jobs and a stronger economy. Then in Western Maine, Go Labs is repurposing the shuttered Madison paper mill and it is on track to become the first North American producer of home and building insulation made from wood fiber. These heritage industries are not merely things of the past, they are also the economic engines of our future. There are also challenges that are common to all economic sectors broadband and child care in particular. The stories are all around us. A father of four in Owl's Head who has to bring his daughters to a restaurant to connect to Wi-Fi to get their homework done. A Blue Hill doctor struggling to view his patient's charts during remote telehealth sessions. A high school student in Hope, Maine who missed 16 days of school because of dropped connections. And yes, even a governor of Maine who couldn't connect to a public health media briefing in the state's capital. It seems like everyone has a story about slow or no internet in Maine. Sometimes it can seem like, well, that's just the way things are and that's the way it'll always be. But I don't believe that and neither do you. Roads and bridges continue to demand our, our attention and are a major focus of bonding, especially during times of historically low interest rates. But high speed internet is as fundamental as electricity, heat, and water. It's the primary way of connecting with others in the 21st century. It's the modern equivalent of rural electrification in the 1930s, or the inter interstate highway system in the 1950s. We need to have high-speed internet throughout our state, 
and with willpower and perseverance, we will get there. With the build out of the NECEC transmission line, we will have the advantage of new fiber infrastructure from Jackman to Pownell and from Windsor to Wiscasset and $10 million in grants for middle mile and last mile connections for all those host commun communities. Last year, my administration asked for $15 million in bond monies to expand broadband. The first new investment in internet expansion in more than a decade, and you approved. This year, I'll be asking for an additional $30 million for infrastructure and for internet that is affordable for Maine families, students, seniors, businesses, and workers across the state. I'm asking this on behalf of every child who could not learn remotely this year because they could not zoom into a classroom. I'm asking for every entrepreneur who could not open the door of their new business because they couldn't get online. I'm asking for the father or mother who wanted the child to Zoom with the grandparents but couldn't do it. I'm asking for every person who's considering moving to Maine but wondering if they'll be able to work remotely. One software engineer named Ryan told a newspaper recently that he and his wife moved from Boston to Maine in July because, in part, they found a place where they can work remotely. We know if we build it, they will come. Reliable high-speed internet is one thing families desperately need. Affordable, accessible childcare is another. One mother named Savannah in Cherryfield told us she was on a wait list for more than a year and a half for childcare for one of her kids. Another woman named Cassie in Sydney started looking for childcare when she was five months pregnant and called more than 40 facilities after having her baby and right after she was scheduled to return to work. She was finally able to find a slot in a home-based childcare place 30 minutes away. Before the pandemic, close to 5,000 Maine children with working parents, mainly in rural areas, did not live close to a childcare provider. Millions of working women nationwide, including thousands in Maine, have been forced to leave the workforce during the pandemic because they didn't have reliable childcare. My back-to-work proposal will seek $6 million for no or low interest loans to renovate, expand, or construct childcare facilities and increase the availability and quality of childcare slots with half that money going to underserved communities in rural Maine. Knowing your child is being taken care of is key to staying in the workforce and providing for your family. As someone who raised five daughters and as the grandmother of two little girls, I know how precious that peace of mind is. We'll have more to say in the coming weeks on the back to work proposal. It'll also include investments in roads and bridges, working lands and waterfronts, research and development and energy efficiency. All these proposals will create jobs and will strengthen our economy, particularly in rural Maine. We'll use every tool we have to build a healthy, strong and safe state. From the supplemental and biennial budgets to a back-to-work bond proposal to other legislation with the help of the legislature and partnerships with the private sector. Just as we rose to meet the challenge of the coronavirus pandemic, we will rise to meet the challenge of restoring our economy, never resting until we are stronger than ever before. You know, I've received hundreds, maybe thousands of handwritten notes from Maine people this past year. I read about their stories, their hopes, their heartaches. Some messages I've read have stayed with me long afterwards. One young mother writes every week. She's busy teaching her children at home, keeping a small business going with her husband, and training the new family dog. Recently, she watched the movie the Fellowship of the Ring with her kids, and she wrote me about that. She told me about the scene in which Frodo says, quote, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened." End quote. And Gandalf responds, quote, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what we do with the time that is given to us. She felt there was a lesson in there for her children and maybe for the people of the state of Maine. None of us wish to see the times we've seen these last 12 months. But that is not for us to decide. All that we can do is decide what to do with the time that is given to us. And that's what Maine people have done. 
we, like the rest of the nation, were dealt a bad hand last year, but we're pushing through. We will get to the other side. We will not only survive, we will rise a better, greater state for all that we have endured and all that we have learned and all whom we have saved. We are a country and we are a state that knows compassion, that acts with courage, that values community. We are a people who persevere. That's us. Now it's time to get our state back on track, focus on the future, and aim for the stars. Last Friday, an American-made rover named Perseverance, operated remotely from NASA headquarters, landed on Mars. We rooted with pride for this little vehicle, just as we did 50 years ago when American heroes first set foot on the moon. That rover's fiery entry through the, through the Martian atmosphere was actually made possible by heat shield materials produced by a company in Bitterford, Maine. The next rover, a human mission, we expect will be aided by a deceleration system invented by engineers at the University of Maine's Advanced Structures and Composites Center. And one day, commercial rockets launched with bio-derived fuels made at Brunswick Landing may take to the skies from limestone, Maine. For now, Perseverance has put Maine on the map. And for now, Perseverance is also a prerequisite for the future, our password to success, our passport for getting our state back on track. As we look up at the stars tonight, as I did with my grandfather many years ago, we'll tell our children about American ingenuity, about Maine's place in the future, about the beauty of our world and our state, and about the perseverance of our people. With that perseverance, our state will prevail. Please keep the faith and stay safe. Now that was Governor Mills with her State of the Budget Address, laying out her administration's response to the COVID pandemic and putting forward a balanced $8.4 billion budget to the legislature with a focus on health care, schools and jobs. You can join us right now live on our website or mobile app as we break it all down with our new center main political analysts. But for now, back to your regularly scheduled program. that we can have his yep. response. Oh. Are you there, there Senator Timberlake? I'll start over now because it's the usual thing with Zoom. Yeah, please do. Unmute the yourself. world the world we live in, an unusual state of the budget address and an unusual Republican response. Jeff Timberlake, I asked you what your response is. Yeah, and I and I said thank you for uh for inviting uh, me to join you tonight and um, what I heard is uh, it's the first I've heard of it. We didn't get a copy of the address when we started. So uh, I heard it as you heard it. And what I heard tonight was that she talked about all the good things that a lot of companies in the state of Maine have done. And I thought that was important to recognize all those people and to recognize the, the fact that uh, we had a lot of people that, that are hurting. And I think every one of us recognize that. And there isn't anybody whether they be Republican, Democrat, or independent that wishes bad on anybody, we're all looking to, to make Maine a better place. Um, one of the things that I was looking to hear tonight was how we was going to work together into the future. Um, and I didn't hear much talking about how the governor and the legislature was going to communicate uh, moving forward. I mean, we're, we're into, headed into March in another week. We'll be almost uh, three months into session and we are headed into our first, uh, the, conven the convening of a session, the convening of the legislature will be on March 10th and possibly 11th to hear the first bills. And um, this is my 12th year and that's very unusual to ever go this far down the road. Um, the things that I didn't hear also tonight that really bothered me a little bit was that I, uh, when she talked about tax conformity, um, I, I think that they talk about the 99% and then the 1%. Well, I think the thing that everybody needs to remember is that 1% is 251 businesses or 40,000 hardworking Mainers in the state of Maine. And I think it's very important to remember 
that just because they got over a million dollars, the reason they got that is because they employ more people. I think it's so important to remember that these are hardworking Mainers and we need to support them just like we supported the 99% below that. So I, I really hope that we find a way in the next few days uh, before March 10th to, to come to conclusion on the tax conformity. I think, uh, you know, some of the other things that we heard tonight, we heard an awful lot about the COVID. And I think for the last uh, year, that's about every one of us have lived in our life. I mean, you know, we're on our, our 12th executive order. I think it's time that we find a solution to that, that we find a way that the legislature and the executive branch work together and unite. And I think two heads are better than one. And I think we need to find a way that we can be part of the discussion and part of how we move Maine forward. Um, I was elected to represent, you know, basically almost 40,000 people in I don't feel that I've had the chance to represent them as well as I should because we haven't been in there or haven't had the conversations. And I think it's so important that we remember that, that, you know, the representatives and the senators are, are were elected to do a job and we need to have them doing that job. I think the other thing, as I go down through my notes here that I, that I wrote is broadband. I don't think anybody disagrees that broadband is very important. Um, I think we got to look at all new avenues of broadband, not just running fiber cable, but looking at satellite, looking at cellular, looking at all different options. I think we need to invest in that. Um, I think it's important. There's not one Republican or independent or Democrat that I know that doesn't place this as a very top priority. Uh, another thing that, that I didn't hear a lot about, I heard a little tiny bit about was nursing homes. Um, anybody that knows me and our caucus and the Republican caucus has been very strong on nursing homes in the, you know, in the, in the past few years because of the funding that they need and how they're underfunded. And if we've seen it at all during this pandemic, nursing homes are the one taking some of the biggest heat. Um, I'm just going down through my list here as I look at this. I think the other thing that that brought a little bit of attention to me was schools. Uh, if I'm not, I'm, if I'm hearing anything around, uh, I'm hearing that it's time for us school children to start to find a way to get back to school in, in a five day a week basis. Uh, we need to be safe. We need to do it. You know, the other day, Sunday, I rode by Hebron Academy and, and rode down by St. Dom's. Both of those are operating five days a week and have been all year. I think our public schools need to be encouraged. It's, there's nothing stopping them but I think the legislature has to find a way to encourage them to get our kids back to school. I got a grandson who's 15 years old who told me this week um, that, you know, it's time for him to, to get back to school five days a week. He's going two days a week. Um, I think it's important socially, not just for the learning, but for the social aspect. I think one of the things that's really hurt the legislature is the social aspect of our committee's meeting and we haven't to build that camaraderie with camaraderie with our members across the aisle. That uh, when you're sitting in a committee meeting and you got a bill and you got a bill that you could probably find a solution to, but because we're on Zoom, everybody gets to hide behind the camera. And it's happening all of the time, and you don't get to to say, "Hey, can you step out in the hall with me for a minute?" And you have a conversation with somebody and then you come back with a solution to the problem. We don't have that. Uh, as I say, I've served 12 years and I see things more partisan this year on both sides. Um, and it's not because people intend to be partisan, but we're not meeting face to face or mask to mask as we'd like to say. And I think those are all things we need to do. Um, we need to get back together. We need to get back to doing our job. Other businesses in the state of Maine have figured out how to do it, you know, BIW, IDEX, TAM Brands, all these huge companies have figured out how to bring their employees back to work and do the people's business. And I think it's time that we as legislatures figure, legislators figure out how we're going to get back to work and do the people's business. Um, as I look back through this, um, one of the things that was spoke about is the spending. And, and I just hope that 
Uh, with all the spending that's being talked about with the response to COVID, I hope that our counterparts on the other side of the aisle will agree not to pass pieces of legislation that will increase spending for wants and not for needs. Because the meaning by that is just because we want to pass a new law, but I think we only should be increasing spending on things that we need to increase spending on, things that we need to pay for. I think that's of the utmost importance. And those are some of the things that, that I look at as, as we needing to do. Um, I agree with the governor that it's gonna take total involvement by everybody in the state of Maine from you know seniors, teachers, entrepreneurs, healthcare workers, farmers, fishermen, as she went down the list, people of all walks of life to fix this. And I think it's very important that we all work together to get there. And uh, we need to do it safely. I don't, I'm, I'm not pushing to do anything to, to, to rip the mass off and just go out. That's not what I'm pushing. I, we need to go back to work, but we need to get main businesses working again. Um, if I hear anything up and down the street when I'm, when I'm out going to the local stores or the local market is, you know, when are you going back to work? And that's where I'm kind of at. Um, willing to answer uh, about any question you want. I, I think the one other thing that I heard through the whole thing was that was the playing as a team. Uh, she talked about baseball and everything else. Well, I think it's time the legislature and the executive office plays as a team. You know, you want to be part of that. You need to play with a team with us and make us part of your discussion and part of the team. And until that happens, it's going to be hard. Senator Jennifer? Timberlake, yeah, I appreciate um, your comment about your in being ready to get back to work and be together. I know that when you do meet, though, it will be in the Augusta Civic Center. You all will be socially distanced. You will not be in the same building as the governor. Are you optimistic that despite the the, the actual physical distance uh, being down the road, down one exit on the highway, you will be able to work together with the executive branch. Well, I... I...